approaching Saturn. You are only seconds away. During the late 1990s, things were less than peachy keen at Sega. Back then, they were a hardware manufacturer and had been quite a competitor to Nintendo and Sony. In 1994 and 1995, they had released the Sega Saturn first in Japan and then in North America and Europe. It was their first foray into 3D gaming, and while it was quite the hot item in Japan, its sales in the West were less than impressive. It had lifetime sales of about 9.5 million units, which pales in comparison to its competitors. Nintendo 64, which was released a couple years later, and sold nearly 33 million units, and the Sony PlayStation, which was also released in 1994, and sold over 100 million units. There are many reasons why the Sega Saturn didn't do very well. It did, however, help lay the groundwork for Sony's next console, the Dreamcast. Released in 1998 in Japan and in 1999 in the West, the Dreamcast was pretty hot stuff when it came out, and it still is to this day. While it wound up being Sega's last console, discontinued with worldwide sales of over 10 million units, the Dreamcast still has a following down to this day, and new games still are being produced for it. In fact, franchises that started their lives on the Dreamcast have managed to live on, finding new life in new places. So what made the Dreamcast so special that it is still loved 16 years later? That's what we'll be talking about on today's episode of the Black Man and Robin Irregular Game Show. Also, before we proceed, I'd like to mention our giveaway. For this episode of Bigs, we're giving away a Steam key for the Dreamcast Collection. The Dreamcast Collection includes four classic Sega games, Crazy Taxi, Space Channel 5 Part 2, Sega Bass Fishing, and Sonic Adventure DX. But that's not all. If we reach 1,280 followers on Instagram, the Dreamcast was 128 bits after all, or if we reach 6,400 followers on Twitter by December 1st, 2015, we will be giving away a Sega Dreamcast. We can only ship it within the United States, but if you live here in America and would like to own one, this is your chance. For more details about this, just visit blackmanandrobin.com, and if you don't see our post about this on the front page, just type Dreamcast Giveaway into the search box and it'll pop right up. Sega. So, the Dreamcast came out over 16 years ago. Why is it still relevant today? That might have a lot to do with the Dreamcast's piracy problem, of all things. The Dreamcast employed the GD-ROM disc format. The GD-ROM is much like the CD-ROM. It was a proprietary format developed by Yamaha. It differed from the CD-ROM in that the pits on GD-ROM discs were spaced more closely together allowing up to a gigabyte of data to be stored on a disk. More specifically, it was 1.2 gigabytes. Sega's decision to go with the GD-ROM takes some of the blame for the Dreamcast's demise. While it provided more room than CD-ROMs, and a measure of protection from piracy because you couldn't copy games onto GD-ROM disks, these GD-ROMs weren't quite as big as DVDs, which were employed by the Xbox One, I mean the original Xbox, and the PlayStation 2. Remember, in the early 2000s, movies on VHS tapes were still being sold, and DVD players were hot-ticket items. Part of what helped sell the PlayStation 2 was its ability to run DVDs. The Xbox original could also run DVDs, but you needed to purchase a dongle for it. But that's a discussion for another day. What does all this have to do with the Dreamcast's piracy problem, you ask? Well, because you couldn't purchase blank GD-ROMs with these, Perhaps Sega imagined that no other copy protection would be necessary on the system? Perhaps that's why the system is almost DRM-free. Anybody with a CD burner and some blank discs could download Dreamcast games from the internet, burn them, and have playable discs that they could just pop into their Dreamcast at any time. But wait, you may be wondering, how could the system that used gigabyte-sized GD-ROMs run games on CDs? Well, besides the fact that not every game used up the whole gigabyte, Piracy groups sometimes downsampled music, removed assets, and used other tricks to reduce the size of Dreamcast games. Piracy, lack of DVD support, the terrifyingly great marketing from their competition, Sony, and other factors led to the Dreamcast's demise. Funnily enough, however, piracy has helped keep the system relevant today. Because it's so easy to burn games from the Dreamcast, not only was it easy to, less than legally, obtain a library from the console after its discontinuation, 
but the fact that anybody can release games from the system means that it's possible to develop and release a new Dreamcast game with a lot more ease than for another game console such as the PlayStation 2 or Xbox original. There's no need to obtain a license from Sega to develop on the system. Can't lose guys like this. Somebody get NBA 2K1, go to Sega.net through the Dreamcast and knock these Sunshine boys out the box. You're in violation. Dang! Shut up! Made it easy for everyone. The Dreamcast's ability to run burned games has led to a few independent developers releasing games on the Dreamcast. For instance, there's Sturmwind, a shmup published by Red Spot Games in 2013. From what I've heard, it's a fantastic game. If you're looking for a good-looking Dreamcast map, you'll want to check it out. Released in 2015 alone were quite a few other games, such as Alice's Mom's Rescue, a rather cute 2D platformer which is also available for the Atari Jaguar, that's another tragedy for another day, the indie puzzler Leona's Tricky Adventures, and the upcoming RPG Pure Solar and the Great Architects. The Dreamcast is hardly unique in this aspect. There are other old consoles for which people still make new games. For example, the Nintendo Entertainment System just received a new RPG called Quest Forge. Then too, there's the game Sydney Hunter and the Caverns of Death, which was a big Kickstarter success and is coming to the NES and SNES, having raised nearly $40,000. Funnily enough, the developers have announced a Dreamcast version of the game, although right now there's just a bit of pre-alpha footage and not very much information about this version of the game. So while developers still make new games for old consoles, there is something about the enthusiasm that people have for the Dreamcast that has kept it relevant. A large part of what fuels today's enthusiasm for the Dreamcast, I think, are the great games that were released for it. Some of them were weird, but amazing. Don't believe me? Alright, I'll describe to you four of the best and strangest games on the Dreamcast. These are games that are wonderfully fun and tremendously creative. Number one. A rhythm game set a half millennium into the future in which intergalactic television stations are jockeying for ratings. Yours is going through a hostile takeover, and you have to dance to the beat in order to defeat the evil robots that are taking over your station. Oh, and Michael Jackson guest stars in the game. Number two, a virtual pet fish with the face of a man that listens to your voice commands. Leonard Nimoy voices your journey as you raise the fish into a frog-like creature. Number three, you might know this one, a video game in which you are an irresponsible taxi driver racing the clock to pick up passengers and pick them off at various points in the city. The faster you get to where you need to be, the more money you'll make. Number four, a game in which you race around a city on rollerblades and spray paint graffiti while trying not to be shot by the police. If they hit you, you need to pick up more paint in order to gain more health. Do you see the point here? The Dreamcast was a home to many unusual and daring video games. Weird was welcome on the Dreamcast. It wasn't all quirky titles, however. Some slightly more serious games succeeded on the system. Games that have found success that goes on into our day. Now how our fans engage in the future of gaming continues to astound us. During E3 of 2015, Sony announced that Shenmue 3 was in development. In case you're not familiar with it, the Shenmue series started on the Dreamcast. It was a sort of open-world adventure with a story that was never quite finished, and fans have been clamoring and campaigning for a new game for the last several years. During the press conference, it was unveiled that Shenmue 3 was on Kickstarter. In less than eight hours, the Kickstarter raised over two million dollars. By the campaign's end, Shenmue 3 raised over 6.3 million dollars. And it was revealed that the reason for the Kickstarter wasn't to pay for the game, 6.3 million isn't enough to cover development of Shenmue 3. Rather, the purpose was to prove to investors that the interest for a new Shenmue game wasn't just talk, but that the fans were willing to slap down real money. The Shenmue 3 Kickstarter not only proved interest in the franchise, but in the console it originated on. Sales of the original Dreamcast game began to raise prices of the title online, and people began purchasing Dreamcasts in order to play the game. During the summer of 2015, retailer GameStop started selling Dreamcast systems and software, which was quite the unexpected revival. So was it the Dreamcast's tragic story that saves it in the end? Perhaps. The console was ahead of its time in several aspects. For instance, it supported online play out of the box, shipping with a modem that attached to the side of the console. Additionally, online play was free. The original Xbox, launched two years later, also supported online play out of the box, albeit for a cost. It was also ahead of the game in that it included a controller with a screen. We didn't see that again until the Nintendo Wii U. That came out in 2012, 2013 in Brazil, 
and at the time of this video's production has sold around 10 million units, just like the Dreamcast. Of course, the Wii U isn't really the Nintendo Dreamcast. Sure, it has a game about fighting with painting, but it's a different animal in a different zoo. We may never see another Dreamcast in the industry, but we continue to see what the Dreamcast has done down to this day. That's why, 16 years later, the Dreamcast is still thinking. What do you think? Is the Dreamcast still relevant today, or have I been yammering on about nothing? Be sure to let us know. You can follow on Twitter at Blackman and Robin for all the latest game news, reviews, previews, and interviews. Follow me at Jordan underscore Cameron for my own views on retro gaming, and be sure to check out our giveaway at BlackmanandRobin.com.